Hello, my name is Peter Buckingham and uh, thank you very much for joining me for our webinar. We wanted to uh, do this webinar as we recently did an Educate Plus um, summit and we were the major sponsor and we were able to talk to a lot of people about demographic mapping for schools and for strategic planning. We found a lot of interest and we've done a couple of webinars down this line before. We thought today would be very much where we can show you a lot of the information that is available and show it to you by being able to look at uh, the actual web-based mapping. So you can move around and look at different schools, different areas, whatever you want to see. So let me uh, start with a few slides I need to deal with to start with. Okay, so the demographics in our view are very much it's about how do we make better business decisions for our schools using information that's available to us. Now, most of this information is available through public methods. Uh, it's not confidential information. It's mainly coming out of the Australian Bureau of Statistics. But the hard part about that, as most people would know, is getting it into a format you can look at and making it easy to be able to use. And I'd like to think that what we've done at Spectrum Analysis is created some of those formats and some of them you'll see today. So the big picture on why are demographics required really starts from the beginning. Where are we going to put a school and what is the basis that we make that decision? Greenfield sites. Now they're still happening and we're actually doing some data now where we're building a database to look at how many students are at schools in any area and what is the future population out for the next 10 years looking like. So where are we going to have a huge shortage of schools? And similarly, there are areas around Australia where it's actually the other way and we now have an overage of schools and maybe a drop in population. These sort of decisions are really required by your board if you are going to make ma major capital expenditure, if you're going to expand your school, put in a music centre, put in a pool, whatever it is, these things are big investments. And most investors, banks included, want to know you're going to actually do it on a good basis. The other part we find is interesting is early learning centres. Uh, no doubt that where the population is, where the children are, there's a huge demand for ELCs at the moment. Demographics also can come in very much with enrolments, marketing, even the buses to be able to look at where our buses run, which children are on the bus, which ones aren't, and what can we do to get better bang for our buck from our buses. So our real view is uh, demographics is really all about helping with your strategy and it's not just the wet finger in the air approach. Now, before I go on to the mapping, I just want to give you a quick introduction of what's happening in Australia. And most of you would know that there is the ACARA data. And ACARA data is where the schools, every school has to put in how many students they have. And ACARA data gets broken up to say whether you are in a government school, a Catholic school, or an independent school. So we've set this table up just to show you what it's telling us. So we can see each year, on 2019, 2020, 21, and now 2022. That data only came out about uh, March 2023. So this is the most current ACARA data. So what we can see is what has been the change in each group. And I guess the most interesting is when we look at Australia, we can see 2019 through to 2022 total uh, student population. Now, what's interesting in this is if we imagine 2019 is pre-COVID, before the COVID hit in 2020, 2021 was still a bit of a funny year because people were sort of on the back end of the COVID. And 2022 is probably the first year of settling down back to some form of normal operation. Now, I guess what's most interesting is if we look at the change of percentage change, all in all, number of students increased by 2.68 across Australia. Now, of that total population, the increase was only 0.63 into government schools, 3.99 into Catholic schools, 
and 9.68 into independent schools. So there's no doubt that a lot of independent schools really found gained, had big uh, student number increases based on probably the effects of the COVID and people wanting to move their children into independent school. What I often compare this to is a bit like having shares in the stock exchange. If the whole market is going up and you're going up by the same amount as the market, you're doing okay. You're doing what is expected of you. If the market's going up and you're not going up, you'd be actually asking yourself, why aren't I keeping up with the market? And similarly, if you're going gangbusters and the market's only moving a little bit, then congratulations, you're probably becoming a very rich person. The point of that is I like to think of it in a similar terms with uh, schools and students. So an independent school with just organic growth probably should be up five, six, eight percent anyway. Now, some of this 9.68 percent will be um, some growth areas, a couple other reasons. But the net effect is everybody should have probably had a reasonable rise over the last three years. The next question is what's going to happen in, you probably feel, 2023 now and then 2024 ongoing. And the way I believe you feel at first, it's not going to be kids being pulled out of school and dragged down to the local high school. It's more than likely that children coming in in year six, seven, suddenly they won't quite be there. They will have gone off to a cheaper school or something of that nature. So I guess we're only going to get the feel of this over the next year or two as we actually get to enrolment times. So just to give you an idea, this is done in every state. And I have also brought up, um, as we are Melbourne-based, I've brought up the Victoria effect. Um, total of 3.15% of increase over the 2019-2022. Uh, 1.08 was all that went into Catholic. 2.51 went into government. And 8.8 went ended. So I don't think it's any uh, big issue. You can see that the big growth, and this was common across all of Australia, has been that independent school. Now, again, as we're in Victoria, I thought I'd just like to show this because we all know there is new, uh, the new, I guess the government is, sorry, let me jump to the The government is cutting out the payroll tax in Victoria for 66 schools. And they did it by looking at what is the um, average fee. Now, it's very hard to see the average fee, how they do it these days, but there is a calculation done through the My Schools data where every school is asked and contributes what is their total fees in parent contributions, fees collected, et cetera, and divide that by how many students they have. We then have a reasonable starting point for what the average fee is for that school. I'll show that a bit further because we've got it calculated for 9,000 schools in Australia. But the point of this was in the case of Victoria, where they're saying 66 schools, I believe, are caught up in no longer getting the payroll exemption. That ranges from schools that are showing an average fee of up near $32,000 back to around the $13,000 mark. So if I'm counting backwards, by the time I get to the $13,000 mark, I've counted 65 schools. So somewhere there is obviously the crossover line between when you are going to no longer get an exemption and when you are, uh, have to pay. Now, I'm sure schools, if you were sitting right on that twelve or 13000 you'd be doing your best to uh, not get caught up in it. But some schools, obviously, by the time you're up in the 15s and 20000 you're not going to escape. So that's about the issue we've got in Victoria, which I'm hearing is likely to push through about an 8.5% increase in costs on schools, just mainly due to a Victorian government set of decisions. Okay. Okay. So I'm now going to take us over to have a look at our web-based mapping and I'm just telling everybody now that you only have to go online to Spectrum Analysis on our website, spectrumanalysis.com.au, 
go to services, go to education analysis, and you will see a thing called Gels College Sample Online Mapping. If you click on that, you can play with this system as much as you like. Now, it is restricted. It isn't taking out further than about five or 10 kilometres around our imaginary school, but at least it's a demonstration you can show people. You just click on the Gels College Sample Online Mapping. Okay. Okay, hopefully we're seeing a map. Right, so, okay, so this is a mapping system that's built in a Google type of environment. So I'm just zooming out right now to show you we're looking at all of Melbourne, but I can zoom this and just walk us up to Sydney or wherever I want to go. So our system starts very much with legend. And the legend tells me, and once you've done this a couple of times, you'll rarely ever go back to the legend. Green dots are government, red dots are Catholic, purple dots are independent. When we actually go and look at long at daycare centres, they all have a white square. And depending where the blue or the other colour is, we pretty quickly know if it's a green square above, it's a long daycare centre. If it's a blue on the right-hand side, a dark blue, it's a standalone kindergarten. If it's a light blue on the other side, it's part of a school. And the three at the bottom represent uh, before school, after school or vacation type of care. Now, why this is very handy for a school is we've got 17,006 uh, daycare, kindergartens now mapped, and we can see how many registrations they have and whether they meet the ACARA, uh, the SC government standard secu security. The other things we see here very much is this, the the colours regarding our CIFA, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There is some information to do with census data and our very common when we have something comes up with colour, we always take it with a dark colour being the highest through to a, a light colour normally being the lowest or down the bottom is sort of a green through to a brown. So you rarely ever have to go back to the legend. So when we're on layers, it's as simple as if it's blue, it's on, and if it's grey, it's off. So at the moment, I've got all the schools in Australia turned on, and I'll just show you what that means we can see. So if I go to a school, and I'll pick one here, if I pick Camwell Grammar, uh, I can see the school itself name. I can actually see its website. I'm just going to bring that up just to show you how easy it is to jump on a school's website from this way, which can be really handy if I'm wanting to check school fees at other competitors. I can see how many teaching staff, full-time equivalent teaching, full-time equivalent non-teaching, how many students they've got at 2022. And we have a ratio, which is the number of students divided by full-time teachers. In Camwell Grammar, it's about 9.1. 10 is fairly average, and often you'll see schools out at 12, 14, 16, numbers like that. The next part that's really interesting here is what have their numbers looked like over the last 12, 13 years, 14 years? So the ACARA data gives us the number they had in 2008, and we can see it's gone up slowly to 1327. This tells us what happened each year, and this is the accumulation from 2008 up to 2022. The last number we're seeing here is that number I mentioned a minute ago about what is their average fee, and it's just a really handy way of comparing apples to apples. Now, if I go to some other schools, and I'll just show you an example might be here. Now, this is a school that is not traveling as well as you might hope. It's gone from 1,100 down to 768. So it's actually down 30% over uh, the last 14 years. Now, they still have very strong student-to-teacher ratios. They're at 768. So we can look at any school we like and compare. Now, I'll give you another quick example would be if I compared Camwell Grammar, which I just looked at a minute ago, 
and maybe compare that to, uh, I think it's Trinity would be here or Kerry. Here's Kerry. So if I look at Kerry, we can see how they've traveled. They actually have two campuses and unfortunately everything gets put into one. Their, their number's about $27,000 per year. Now we can go and look at every uh, independent, every Catholic school, typical of a little primary Catholic school. We can see its numbers have gone from 355 to 183. So obviously a, a major issue going on there. And we can see every government school, which is the green one. So here's a Belmore primary school. Uh, oh, it's actually got very few numbers. I'll just take us down to one that I may know a bit easier. Uh, let's go over here. Let's pick up Canterbury Primary, let's say. It's Canterbury Primary School. Again, we can see it's gone from 547 up to 614. Well, this is very handy. We've done a few jobs specifically for Catholic schools. And quite often the Catholic secondary school may be down and they're looking for reasons why. Well, quite often they have very nominated uh, Catholic primary schools. And when you go and look at the individual Catholic primary schools, they can be down 25, 30%. And therefore it's causing the problem on the secondary school that relies on that to feed it. Okay, I'll turn off uh, some of the schools just for simplicity and I'll bring on all the daycare centres. So again, we can look at them individually and see what they are. This little one, we can see the blue square on the side means it's an independent kindergarten. So we can actually see it has 51 approved places. It has a contact point, has a phone number, has an email, and it's exceeding the national quality standards. So all good news for that one. Uh, here's a green square at the top. It's Samantha's daycare center. Again, all good. We know it's got 62 places. And then if we find, sometimes they're not often, but there's ones that are sides of a school, uh, Press Hill, it's actually the kindergarten part of the Press Hill school. It has 30 places. So I guess if from a marketing point of view, you're wanting to know what are the kindergartens like or preschools around your area, it gives us a really good way of looking at it. Now we can break it down. We can say, let's just look at the long daycare centers. Every one of those now has the green uh, block on top. If we said, no, we're mainly interested in preschool kindergartens, we can bring them up and we can see all of those around our areas. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is CIFA. CIFA, I'm going to bring it out a little bit, stands for Socioeconomic Index for Areas. And when you're thinking independent schools, it's probably a pretty good way of saying, can they afford to pay our fees? Now, we've done quite a lot of work on how the CIFA compares to uh, what percentage of children in the area go to government school. And I'll just explain that first by saying, um, well, let me leave it with CIFA first. So CIFA, if I said to you, how do you judge uh, socioeconomics of an area? Some people may say the average household income. Other people may say the price of the house they live in. Other people may say level of unemployment. Anyway, the ABS put that all together and come up with not one number for every area across Australia. The beauty of that is Mr. and Mrs. Average live at a CIFA of 1004, 1004 in Australia. Now, one standard deviation to the good side is 1100, two standard deviations, 1200. Similarly, going to the other side, 900 and down to 800, and it drops right down to two or 300. So any area we want to look at, we can go to and bring up the CIFA score. So I'll start over here. I'll start any, even if you're interstate, you've probably heard of Turak. So Turak on average has, well, it has 19,940 people and it has a CIFA of 1150. So we're well into the good, very top area. Now, these are working at SA2 areas, standard area two, which is very similar to a postcode. And SA2 is normally about 10 to 12,000, 10,000 people. And we have about 2,300 SA2s across Australia. 
By contrast, we have about 2,600 postcodes across Australia, and often the issue is more out in the regional areas where it might be an SA2 with 10,000 people, but it may have required four or five postcodes to wrap that together. But look, SA2s are the way the government presents their data in a lot of cases, so it's very good for us to work with. So Turex at 1940. If I come down to Malvern, 1137. Malvern East, 1128. Now, I do know that these ones here in Camwell are actually even almost up there with Turak, but there's certain parts. If we went to a smaller area, um, what's called an SA1, we could actually look at any little group of about 400 people and see the absolute top level. But that gets very clunky, so it's much easier to work at SA2 so we can see across the area. So SA2's dark blue is the top 20%. Light blue is the next 20%, so Mount Waverley, Glen Waverley. You can see we're all in this bit over a 1,000 mark for Melbourne. Wheelers Hill. Then we'll go to the white areas, 1056, uh, Mulgrave. 1043. The next ones down in Victoria are the orange areas, light orange, and then eventually the brown areas, 900. And probably we can find some areas down in Melbourne that are more in the uh, Doveton, maybe in the high 800s. So CIFA is the best way, and to be honest, it correlates very similarly to average household income, but CIFA is the best way to think in terms of what are we likely to be able to charge for our fees? You wouldn't be trying to run a full fee, you know, $30,000 uh, a year independent school down around Doveton, or you'll really struggle. Now, we can even look just as easily at those schools that are there. Okay, that's part of a college, a Cedar College. Another one, same one, I think. I'll just go over to here. Okay, so Mar Maranatha Christian School, it's gone backwards a bit. Okay, and their fees are about the $7,000 mark. Obviously, if I come into here, most of the fees are going to be near the $30,000 mark and probably those schools we were looking at. Uh, if I'm coming into a, a white area down here, okay, Heatherton Christian, $6,000. So we can see the correlation fairly much between the fees and the areas and the socioeconomics of the areas. Many people ask us they want to look at census data. So what we've done is you can look at the census by going to quick stats in the ABS or many different ways. What we've done to make it easy for people is we've done it so that we can start off in the 2016 census, which is the brown, and we can look at their population, the average income. We can look at how the spread of age groups are. And the next thing that we find very interesting is at census time, you're asked, uh, do you have children? Yes, no, boy, girl, yes, no. Then do they go to ELC? Do they go to primary school? Do they go to secondary school? You would have filled that in. And then do they go to government school, Catholic school or independent school? The beauty of that is we, when we're actually looking at an area, we're not looking at it by counting the number of kids at the individual schools. We're looking at, from the census, where the people live and what they actually do. So if I'm looking at this area, I can actually see that 137 girls went to uh, independent secondary school, 137 boys, 96 girls went to the Catholic Secondary, 76 boys, 291 went to government school of female and 448 boys. Now, we then set that as a percentage. So what becomes common is what is the percentage of children at independent school compared to Catholic, compared to government? And I realise people could be watching this from Catholic schools and so there's no issue. What we'll often do in a lot of work further down where we're looking at market share is we actually put the Catholic and independent together and say it's sort of looking at how many children go to government school in that area compared to how many go to Catholic slash independent, i.e. are prepared to pay some form of higher fee. 
So we can get this percentage for every area. And the last thing we have in this, which I'll come back to in a sec, is language spoken at home. Now, when you look at an area and you say, what is the ethnicity? You can ask yourself, where are people born, which the census collects, and then what language do they speak at home? And you find areas like a, I use Springvale in Melbourne or Cabramatta in Sydney, where the parents had come across from Vietnam back uh, in the 70s, one generation, we're probably into the second generation now. If I look at uh, where people are born, it's probably not much from Vietnam, I'd only be showing 10 or 20%. But if I bring up language spoken at home in those areas, I might be getting 50% or 60%. So think of this from a marketing, that if you were going to, as well as doing whatever marketing material you do, you're going to have some things translated into other languages. What would be the best way to think of that is probably what the language spoken at home at the house is. So it gets quite in, interesting in this is I've just picked an area down uh, Doveton. We can actually see here that it had 21% Chinese. Uh, Indo-Aryan is when we group together all the Indian, Indian Pakistan, subcontinent. Uh, Arabic, obviously the Middle East. Uh, Southeast Asian, Austro-Asian is the Indonesia, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, that group. And then the other non-English, normally is a very high percentage of Italian, Greek, um, Eastern European type of languages and European languages that obviously aren't English. Now, we can obviously move this around and I'll just jump back into our, if I go to say a Turak type area. Again, we can see what the age groups are. We'll probably see a lot less percentage of five to 18 year olds. What we can actually see here is like 78% of the students that live in Turak uh, go to secondary independent school, 13% go to Catholic school, and 8% go to government. So obviously very typical of a very high socioeconomic. I'll take us up to the northern developing areas of Melbourne. If I go and have a look at Doreen, uh, we're still going to get, uh, well, about 18% go to independent school, about 60% to government and about 21 to Catholic. And because we've done some work up in this area, I do know it, it has quite a, it's coming on with a very strong Indo-Aryan uh, language now, uh, language spoken home. Now, note, I've just looked at the 2016 data. All I'm doing now is I'm going to change it to the 2021 data and I'll go back to Doreen. So now it's green. So green equals 2021, brown equals uh, 2016. And if I go down and look at that, it's uh, we've now got 3.8% Indo-Aryan. So in the five years, you can see it's jumped from 1.8 to 3.8. So this just allows us to go in and look at the actual census data. Now, the most important thing I believe is looking forward, population forecast. Now, if we talk through a census cycle, I need to go back to 2016 to start this run. So 2016, we had a census. 2017, that census data came out. 2018, they put out the CIFA data. 2019, at this point in time, the uh, Department of Health is getting a little frustrated wanting to know where to open hospitals. So via whoever, the Prime Minister, they basically go back to the ABS and say, hey, you've got to give us population projections so we can work out for the Department of Health where we're going to put hospitals and all of the medical-related things. So in October 2019, the ABS put out a data set that said, okay, we're going to give you predictions, population predictions from 2017 to 2032. So a 15-year window. And what we're going to do is give you how many boy, girl, 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, and on it goes. So to us, that is the gold medal data we believe we all should be using. Now, we, after COVID, we've gone back to the ABS and said, hey, you're going to do an upgrade. Their answer is, well, no, but a new one is almost due. So that came out in October 2019. 
Then in 2021, August, we had the next census, the current census. It came out in 2022. This year, we've had the CIFA data come out, and we're expecting to get this population projection data coming out, uh, I'll say, mid-next year. So the most current federal ABS population projection is still the 2019. And we have checked it in a lot of cases against what happened so we've got this starting from 2017 through, and of course in 2021 we have the census, the census data comes out and we can compare apples to apples at that point in time. And look, it's pretty right. Everybody knows that immigration cut down over the COVID years, but we're now moving from, we were bringing in 180,000 immigrants back in the teen years. The Liberal government dropped it to about 150,000 in the late uh, sorry, I'll rephrase. In the 13, 14, 15, we're up near one, one, 180. In the 17, 18, 19, we were nearer the 150. We've gone through the COVID years and you only have to have been watching the news and you'll hear the government talking about numbers like 400,000 coming in. So anything that fell behind over those COVID years is really going to get picked up. But a lot of it, I've said, is not actually people coming and going from Australia. A lot of it were people and we have uh, workers of ours who are here in Australia on a student visa and they're finally, in fact, today, one of them actually finally got his clearance, his final uh, approval, NAM got his approval. And NAM hasn't left this country basically since for six years. So in paper, it'll say he has now become an immigrant today. The truth is he's been here the whole time. So it really doesn't, didn't have much effect. So even though there's many state governments put out their own predictions, and I'm not critical of that, but I'll always just say there can be a bit of political uh, sway that goes into that to look a bit better, look a bit worse, whatever they're trying to do. My view is we go back to the ABS data. So let me just bring up, firstly, we have total population projections. And again, we tend to go from our colouring of a dark colour through to a light colour, uh, sorry, a dark colour through to a uh, light and normally right through to often a brown. So this is just looking at Melbourne. And in total population, if I go to Alert, it's actually going to grow from 20,000 to 42,000 in total population over that uh, basically 11-year period. So it'll go up 92%. Just to give you an idea, Australia normally grows about 8% in a census period, from one census to the next. Double that, we normally end up about 16% uh, over two census periods or about 10 or 11 years. So organic growth will be about 16% over about a 10 or 12-year period. So 92% is obviously huge. If I'll just go to a light green area, uh, Gisborne, going to grow the typical 16, 18%. It's sort of a bit too far out to be getting the benefit of the big growth spurt on the edge of Melbourne. If I come in, and I'll, even though the colour is still the same, the colour's following because of a lot of regional Australia is not growing and therefore it, the percentages sort of get pulled back. So here's Hawthorne in Melbourne, 15%. Uh, East Hawthorne, seven, 18%. Then Camwell's only going to be about 9%. We start moving into some of the more developed areas that really not much new buildings going on. It's only going to grow 5%. And then you'll get these sort of areas like Wan Turner. Now, Wan Turner or Mill Park, quite a few in this, similar in other cities. The whole area was built 30, 40 years ago. Mum and dad moved in. Mum and dad had two, three, four kids. Half the houses have still got empty nesters. Mum and dad are still there in their 60s. And only about half the houses have turned over to start to get new populations coming in. So the net effect of those areas in a lot of cases is it's actually having a negative population because the average household size is being influenced by the, the empty nesters at two compared to people who have children might be three and a half it's still getting dragged down and held very low now the biggest thing i believe the most important one 
I see is this one. Rephrase. Come back here. Is this one? This is population forecasts of naught to eighteen year olds over the next ten or eleven years. So, I'll just open an area. I'll stick around the Surrey Hills. So, what we're seeing firstly is we've got twenty twenty two to twenty thirty two, and this is being done at standard area two data. So, this is as for data is produced by the federal government, the ABS. What we do is we use naught to fours as typical of early learning centres or kindergarten. So we can see in this area, it's going to grow by 7% of naught to fours. So kindergartens are still going to be strong. Five to 11. So the data went naught to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, 15 to 19. So we've done a little bit of a cut and a slice around that to try and make this area typical of primary school. So 5 to 11, yes, they're going to grow about 7%. Can't explain quite why, but then the next group, the secondaries in this area, were saying they're actually going to drop a fraction. But when we look at a K to 12 school, it's going to grow for an area about 2.8%. So 2.8% more children should be in this area by 2032 than there are in 2022. Now, Campwell's the next one in beside. It's going to grow at about 4.5%. What's often interesting is some of these empty nester type of areas. Well, Turak itself is a classic. Now, you only have to know Turak or probably Double Bay in Sydney, and you'll say, well, younger people that are likely to have children are very unlikely to be able to afford to get in there, and the older people living in the beautiful big houses are, are going to stay there till they get carted out. So Turak is actually actually going to drop by 69 children over the next 10 years compared to what it's got in 2022. And a couple of those empty nests, the ones I mentioned, I often use Mill Park as a classic, exactly like the other one I mentioned. It's actually going to drop by 141 school-aged children over the next 10 years. So don't go opening a campus in the likes of Mill Park. Um, Eltham's another problem. Again, they're often because they've been developed years ago and no other health and, and even Wonga Park are probably because development is very hard to get approvals. They're not seeing much growth. Box Hill, on the other hand, as anyone living in Melbourne knows, is getting a lot of very big uh, residential high rises. I think Epping in Sydney is a similar and it's actually forecast to grow 21% and it's be done purely because of development whereas the next couple of suburbs either side aren't allowed to develop like that, so they're not having much growth. To me, this is the main thing, uh, you know, we should be looking at anywhere we want to go. Now, in Melbourne, I just want to show you what's happening in a couple of the big growth corridors, and the classic one is the Werribee Growth Corridor. So if I go into uh, Truganina it's going to grow about 8,500 children from 9,000 to 17,000. Sitting beside it is Tarnit, going to grow another 6,200. And then next to it is uh, Wyndham Vale, going to grow another 3,500. So when we add that together, it's roughly 17,000 more children are going to be in this area in 2032 than there are now in 2022. Huge growth corridor. Bear with me one second because I'll just run you up to Sydney and show you the similar ones that's happening up there. And this is how easy it is with the way our system is. We just go up to Sydney. We're going to just bring it out a little bit to there. Let it just settle. And I'll show you the, the big ones in Sydney if you're a Sydney-based person. Firstly, Marsden Park. It's going to grow 11,000 more children. And if I come down, people who don't know, that's Badgerys Creek Airport that's being built. Uh, north of Badgerys Creek, okay, 1,000 in Mulgoa. Greendale, Austin, another 2,000. Leppington, Cobbety, another 9,000. And you can see the another 2,000 here. So Sydney's biggest growth corridor is probably this southeastern suburbs down to Norellan. 
with also a fairly big swat of big numbers coming up in, in this Marsden Park and in the northern side of Parramatta as well, or Penrith. So they are the sort of growth figures that people need to be thinking about if you're especially talking of doing major change. Okay, the next thing, many schools that deal with this are Catholic, Christian, Anglican, just called a Anglican school or a Christian school, whatever you wish to be. So again, in the census, I'll start with Anglican. The census invited us, are we religious? Which religion are we following? Now, many people have heard that we're obviously becoming more agnostic or atheist and far less people put themselves down as a religion. But what we can see here is by just clicking on this, we've set it up so we can see what it said in 2016 and then what it said in 2021 and what the change has been, 2.3% drop. Many areas have dropped much more, 5.2% uh, in this area. Now, that's one of the Waverleys, Glen Waverley, Mount Waverley, probably pretty similar. So they're only getting about 5% now of people saying they are Anglican. So similar to Anglican, we've obviously pulled the Catholic number. And I've always been a bit of a believer that you tend to follow where your parents were. Uh, if you were probably Italian and middle uh, European, you often migrated to the Melbourne Mel uh, northern suburbs. And then in many cases, the children have headed sort of north up into these growth corridors. But that's a theory. So I can look at any of these areas like Pasco Fail South. Again, it was very much the Italian immigrants many years ago. Still at 39% Catholic in that area. If I take ourselves further north and we'll go up to the growth corridors, still at 41% out in the north. Get up into Craigieburn, still at the 30%. By the time I'm here, um, well, it's really dropped down to 24%. So we can see what the Catholic numbers are all across and not unexpected in Melbourne. They're very much in the northern suburbs and still strong right across the corridors. What we've done here, though, is we've created another layer called Total Christianity just as a way of sort of adding together the Catholic, the uh, Anglican, the Lutheran, everyone who wants to put their hand up that way, just because we now are dealing quite a lot with Christian schools and Christian schools obviously will take whoever uh, wishes to come, but following the religious faith. Um, not unexpectedly, again, is Islamic is very, very strong in Melbourne and Sydney. It's no doubt that as people have come into Australia over the last 10 years, we've had a lot of Islamic immigration and they have more than anywhere else tended to come to Melbourne in Sydney. Now, again, the Islamic growth is normally out in these higher areas in Melbourne anyway, getting your 15% out around Traganina, uh, a bit lower in the established part. That's the established sort of Laverton area. Even Point Cook, 6%. But my, my high growth corridors, I'll, I'll be getting more. Uh, similar again, up in your, the growth corridors in in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, high Islamic then, probably pretty high over here. And I guess you can see how quickly it's jumped from 5.6% to 13%. So we can see the Islamic. I had one school recently were very interested in Indian. They very keen on Indian students. They find them very good. So they are very interested. And the best way of looking for subcontinent is probably uh, percentage of people who are Hindu. So, again, you can find uh, pretty strong pockets of that. Uh, this area in Mernden North, 9% um, basically now. South Morang, we're 6%. Uh, over here, we're at 9%. So, we're getting quite a lot of strong sub subcontinent uh, immigration into this area. Now, if I do look at Sydney, we will get very strong around those inner, inner to middle uh, southwestern suburbs. 
and then again strong Islamic in the uh, the new growth suburbs, the Marsden Parks, and down around there, the other areas. Uh, Jewish in Melbourne, there's very strong pocket of Jewish. Uh, so it's literally one or two suburbs. Uh, Caulfield North, forty six percent. And as soon as we move out, well, 40% at Caulfield South. As soon as we move away, we're at 18% and then down to 3%. And by the time even just straight above it, 7%. And very typical of a normal area, you know, more like very, very low percentage of Jewish. So in Melbourne, they're very con the Jewish people are very concentrated in the Caulfield and Caulfield North. And there are similar pockets in other capital cities. Okay. Okay, so I'll just go back to my slides. I hope. So what can we achieve? By understanding the mapping and data, we can understand where our current students come from. So when we're doing a project with a school, we'll normally actually map the students over the top of this. So there are new layers, extra layers created. What you've seen is basically the background layers, but then we can actually have every student and also a level of market share or penetration where we can look at any area and say, how many students have you got in that area? Divided by how many students go to, we'll normally be using Catholic and government school as the denominator and create a market share. So in your, in your individual school's case, we can see where we're strong and where we're not. So we will normally be mapping current students. We'll normally be mapping future students to say, well, where are they going to come from? And that gives us an ability to sort of say, well, we're reasonably strong in that area. Are we getting more out of that area than we expect or are we dropping off? And that's very important on looking at the future. So we like to identify the future growth areas and work with schools on where to market. Now, I'm not involved in the social media type of marketing. We're much more in physical. So I use the example always of saying, if you've got doubt, go and ask your marketing manager if they're asked to put 10 uh, bus shelters in, the typical bus shelters advertising your school, where would you put them and why? Now, the logic to me is you don't just put them outside the principal's uh, house so it makes them feel good. It's more about saying, well, maybe we even put them in a growth area and saying our bus will be coming here in two years' time or just whatever you think is appropriate, but very much uh, being able to see where the students are and where the growth areas are. A lot of times our mapping is about the bus routes and making sure they are effective. And not only that, being able to say which kids are on the bus which ones aren't that go to your school are not using the bus and maybe it's worth a phone call and you can get that changed and see if it's worth getting the child, children on the bus. So the last thing I just like to say, and this is understanding available information makes for informed decisions, especially if you're making big decisions. I had a school recently telling me, and they're talking of making 30 or $40 million of major, major decisions but they hadn't budgeted anything for consultants to be able to look at things like the demographics around their area. Well, I hate to tell you, but I thought it was ridiculous. Now, uh, you know, if you are going to be making major decisions and spending millions of dollars, surely you want to know what the long term looks like, or at least out the next 10 years. And that's what this type of data is about. So look, I've demonstrated, uh, sorry, any questions? Just gonna stop that. So look, I've demonstrated the data that we have and how you use that's up to you. Many cases you can go and download things. I'm the first to tell you about quick stats, K-U-I-K -K stats from the ABS where you can go and look at an area and that's great. But also you can download huge amounts. You can have huge amounts of spreadsheets. What we're all about is for the schools we work with is making it very easy to use easy to access and being able to jump across quickly. And when we're involved with it, it's our responsibility then to update the data and make it 
stay current with things like census data, things like the ACARA data, uh, all of the bits that we put in there, the ASEQA data, which is the early learning centres. Our job is to keep that current and your job is then to be able to use that as best you can. Just uh, for a quick touch on our mapping, we if you are a uh, Somerset school, when you hook up for Somerset each year, you click on these boxes. There is a box at the bottom called uh, Geodemographic Plus, uh, Mapping Plus. That's about $880 a year. And then you have access Australia-wide for all of the things I've shown you. If you're working with us, it's probably about $1,000 a year. We'll give you a license and set you up with it of what you've seen there. But then when we do a full project with schools, they normally line up for the next three to five years. And then every year we're upgrading their current students, their future students, all the things around their school, the, the market share they've got for each area. And our job with them is to make it so they can understand this data and make better business decisions based on the proper data. So look, on that note, I'm happy to uh, throw it open to any questions you may have. And uh, see what comes. Okay, well, we don't have any questions. Yes, <laughs> sorry. You'll need to turn your volume off. Okay, we're both in the same room today. Yep, so just like to run through a couple of things on the Spectrum Analysis website. Thank you for letting us know it wasn't working. Um, if you go to the services and then the education analysis, this is the page that comes up and you'll see there that Peter mentioned the GELS College sample, online map, data report and market report. So the market report uses data from the analysis and puts it in sort of a marketing plan for you. There's also a schools brochure and an ebook talking about demographics and mapping details of some of the clients, how you can use the data that we prepare with strategic planning, as well as analysis and mapping, and then access to the GeoMapping Plus via the Somerset Education Financial Survey portal. And then that gives you instructions on how to access it, and then specific information for enrolments, marketing, community relations, alumni, and then there's some reviews and you can also subscribe to our strategy news for schools email newsletter now also as a result of today you will be able to see this recording and get the slides if you visit our blog so at the moment this is the information that's there but we'll be adding the youtube recording and uh, the pdf of the slides so i don't think there's any other questions oh thank you angie for letting me know and yes, are there any final questions anyone would like to ask? Otherwise, I'll hand over to Peter to sign off.